Well, there's been a couple trends with skin and soft tissue infections over the last 20 or so years. Um, one of the changes we've seen is that, uh, you know, initially we had resistance with Staph aureus, methicillin resistant Staph aureus, and here in the United States we had more of a clonal resistance with USA 300, uh, where that was many of our outpatient cases. So we started seeing this large spike in methicillin resistant Staph aureus um, in the community. And clinically, that largely represented with a big increase in abscesses, um, deep tissue infections such, such as necrotizing fasciitis and myositis, and um, obviously um, accompanying bacteremia and other infections. Um, I would say over the last few years, we've seen that, you know, and we've obviously gotten used to dealing with community-associated MRSA, we've seen that there's been sort of a shift uh, back towards methicillin-susceptible Staph aureus, or MSSA, and with those MSSA strains, we've actually seen some increased virulence. Um, so for example, we might notice patients with very small abscesses, um, small patches of cellulitis, and they'll actually have overwhelming bacteremia and sepsis accompanying that. Um, I have seen an increase in things such as toxic shock and other toxin-mediated staph diseases. Over the last few years, I've noticed a change in um, skin and soft tissue associated complications, particularly with Staph aureus, uh, things such as necrotizing fasciitis, myositis, uh, deeper skin and soft tissue infections. Um, actually, we've had a few cases of toxic shock associated with um, skin and soft tissue infections with Staph aureus, and many of those have been methicillin susceptible strains uh, with increased virulence factors. So we have noticed a change in the last few years and some of the research and data uh, has borne that out over the last year or two. So gram-negative infections are actually relatively tricky and gram-negative organisms have a number of ways of engendering resistance to anti antimicrobials. And they often do that through a couple mechanisms, but there's sort of two main ways that they'll engender resistance. Uh, one is through what we call um, extended uh, spectrum enzymes, such as extended spectrum beta-lactamases, where they actually hydrolyze certain antibiotics. It might be a uh, beta-lactam antibiotics such as piperacillin. It may actually be a carbapenem such as meropenem. Um, those are called carbapenemases. And um, that's a very common way that certain gram negatives such as E. coli, Klebsiella, um, Enterobacter, um, the whole Enterobacteraceae family engender their resistance. They develop this one enzyme and then the antibiotics hydrolyzed. Usually it's high level resistance in most of those cases. The nice thing is if you can inhibit those enzymes, you actually develop really easy susceptibility. Other gram negatives like Pseudomonas, um, Acinetobacter, Stenotrophomonas, uh, Burkholderia, they engender resistance through a number of different mechanisms. Um, one mechanism that's relatively common is that they will have what's called a, a porin channel mutation. So porin channels are these channels that allow the antibiotic to enter the bacteria. Um, if that channel is completely absent or there's a mutation to it, the antibiotic can't enter in well, so that's one um, potential mechanism. Um, the other is they also have enzymes, slightly different than the enzymes we see for E. coli and the Enterobacteraceae, but we do see that they have some enzymes. AMP-C is the name of a common one that Pseudomonas has. That's a second mechanism. And the third mechanism is they actually have what are called efflux pumps. So these are pumps, they're kind of like bouncers in a bar, where they actually just, the antibiotic will enter through a porn channel and this pump will throw the antibiotic back out. Um, the nice thing with those is um, they don't really engender high level resistance, they'll actually engender a lower level of resistance. So you can dose your antibiotics appropriately, overwhelm the efflux pump and still get some efficacy. But um, when you have something such as Pseudomonas where they have multiple modalities of engendering resistance, um, it's often hard to have you know, antibiotics stay susceptible for long. Um, for E. coli and the Enterobacteraceae, for example, and particularly Klebsiella, if they have one enzyme and you can block it, they sometimes don't have other mechanisms as easily. So this allows us different strategies for managing those gram-negative resistance.